Okay, so uh, I think we're back up and running. So sorry for the delay. Let me just flip this chair up here real quick. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about uh, objects. All right, so last uh, week we were talking about shaders and how you get the shading uh, how to get shaders running in OpenGL. Today, we're gonna talk more about geometry. Um, so on the agenda today, we were gonna talk about, uh, I'm just gonna review some of the content we went over last week and then talk about the Journey Project and talk about Ludumdar, which is uh, two weeks away. All right, so <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's go to the class website real quick and just look at the, uh, the Journey. I went ahead and filled these in and, and put the due dates on them. So at this point in our research project, we are all at the point where we have submitted a pitch for uh, what we would like to work on. And more or less, we were thinking about, you know, what kind of historical journey would we'd like to uh, base our graphics project around. All right, so historical journeys before 1900, G or PG rated. And um, so on Wednesday, uh, we are going to share our the idea that we chose uh, to go with in class. So, <laughs> if you could send me um, a a one, well, actually we're, we'll go round robin. But if you could send me a slide, a PDF slide, then we can put that up on the screen so we can show um, what you are uh, thinking about uh, doing. Okay. Um, and just so just want a single slide with maybe some graphics on it that pitches your project. And then you'll give your elevator speech on Wednesday about what you decided to go with. All right. <clears throat> okay. So uh, then next on the radar is going to be the proposal, which is uh, basically a paragraph that talks about the technical application you'd like to work on. So. Yes, you'll be working on this historical journey, but you're also kind of tying it around. Um, I want to focus on uh, uh, in advance, like a lighting shader, or I would like to focus on um, curved geometry, or I'd like to focus on you know, something that you wouldn't anticipate being covered in great depth in one of the slides. So you know, think of a class topic uh, related to computer graphics and think about how you would want to investigate that. Because most of the time we're going to introduce an idea, but we don't necessarily are going to have time to deep dive into all the implementation details. Okay. So uh, that is going to be coming up due, I uh, believe, next week, right? It's 23rd. <coughs> so on Sunday. So you're going to add this to your um, overleaf template. And uh, yep, so there's some instructions. So just Keep in mind that this is a programming project that you're proposing. So this is, uh, so if you're gonna implement shaders, shaders are probably one of the easiest things you could pick, but also the most flexible because you can work on so many different topics. So uh, I think shaders are a great idea, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be shaders. It could be collision detection or some other uh, technique. <laughs> All right. And then uh, about two weeks after that, you'll have your first project update due, which, um, originally, this was the weekend before, but then I thought, wait a minute, that's the Ludum Dare weekend, so I don't want to uh, conflict there. So we're going to talk about that. So I'll let you read these, and please bring, uh, bring your questions on Wednesday. We can talk more about the due dates and what's involved here, but you guys have seen the uh, template uh, in the past. Okay, so let's take a look at Aldijan. How many people have heard of Ludum Dare? Not even in class. I know I've talked about it. 
<laughs> so Ludum Dare is a, uh, is a programming competition that has been around, <coughs> been around since the uh, early 2000s area. They're, they're up to their number 45 is, is going to happen in just under two weeks. So actually a week from Friday is when, when all the madness starts. And this is why I've been having you guys warm up with the one hour game jam, because um, uh, one thing you've noticed as you've been completing these projects is that the game development has been getting easier and easier. You're not spending as much time like figuring out how do I just put something on the screen or how do I control it with my keyboard or mouse? So we've been using the one hour game jam to help prepare us for this. So <laughs> I would encourage you to, um, Keep working on your ideas. Uh, try to get to the point where you feel like you can create a complete game and within just like two hours. Um, <clears throat> uh, because then for Ludum Dara, you're going to want to create something a little bit more sophisticated than, than what we've been making. Okay, might want to focus on the core mechanic. And, and nobody says that you can't, that all this uh, work that you're doing here doesn't have to apply to your, to your journey project. In fact, I think that they should all complement each other as you're learning to do different things. So uh, what I would encourage you to do <coughs> is, now I'm not gonna require you to submit a game to, to Ludum Dare, but I think it would be a good thing for you to do. Um, and uh, the main reason for that, let me just uh, go to the secure site real quick. So um, the biggest reason for that is you can get feedback on your projects. So you can get, you can write a game and you can get other people's feedback of what they actually thought. So that's a little bit better than maybe input from me. I might say, yeah, you have some technical issues, but you'll get real feedback from people around the world that are in your shoes. Uh, you, you like to make games and you want to be, get better at it. So they've, a lot of these people who give feedback are people who have participated. Uh, they're actually participants in the contest. So they, they have experience working on games, but they can also give you some advice on this felt good, this felt clumsy, you know. Um, uh, and then <laughs> uh, typically how it goes is after the uh, two weeks uh, or the two day, three day competition is over, then for the next three weeks, they uh, all the games are out there for you to play. So people will uh, typically reciprocate. So if you play their game, they'll typically come back and play your game and you need at least 20 ratings in order to get uh, ranked in the whole score, right? So as an example, uh, if I go to, uh, I'll click my game. I don't know if this is gonna go to 45, but okay. I haven't put any details yet because <coughs> I don't know what it is. But uh, if I go over here to my previous games, um, I've got two over here. So this is the last one, this is from the spring. And uh, this is maybe shows a good example of what I would do if I was in a graphics class. Uh, I wanted to figure out how do you do fur in computer graphics, so that was, one of my challenges for that weekend is like, okay, I've been wanting to do fur for years and finally I'm gonna sit down and do it. So I did it and it turned out that the, um, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the game theme happened to be about, um, oh, I forget what the, th the theme was, let's see here. The theme was your life is currency. So I thought, hey, okay. So came up with this idea about a virtual Angora rabbit simulator and, uh, <coughs> The game isn't really all that great, but I, I feel pretty cool, you know, if the, um, the rabbit thing works. But uh, some of the ratings I do typically do better. So ironically, I got 162nd in humor and you're talking about 2000 games. So I guess that's, I feel like I'm pretty, that, that was like a sign that I, I didn't totally mess up humor. Um, and then for audio, I'm typically better on audio than in, in most, uh, most cases. And then, people thought my innovation was good. So you can kind of use this, kind of see that I probably need to work on the fun, <laughs> but um, that's all good because this is, you know, I wouldn't have been able to get, get this kind of feedback if I hadn't participated in this. And uh, typically people will leave comments, right? So, and they'll, they'll point out things that maybe you don't see on your end, like two problems. One is when you die, you can move. Okay, and it's like, oh, okay, I should probably fix that. Uh, two is that when you're dead, you can still feed, clean, brush, and groom it. So, you know, you, you get feedback that you wouldn't normally just get, you know, because people actually try to play your game. They try to beat it and so on. Okay. <laughs> uh, there wasn't very many pet games. So I thought that was nice. It was kind of like on its own. Um, 
so yeah, this is, uh, you know, you can get a lot of good feedback from people um, and get a ranking for your, for your game. Now, <clears throat> uh, the way that it starts is about a couple of weeks before the competition starts, they have the theme slaughter. And so the first week, everybody gets to submit a theme. Uh, and then the next couple of weeks, then you just go around and saying, this is dumb, this is dumb, this is dumb. I like this idea. So for example, over here, brains, would this be a good theme? Sure, why not? That sounds like fun. Uh, mutual destruction. <laughs> that sounds complicated. So I'm gonna click no. Missing move options. That sounds like, like normal. I'm gonna go with no. That, <laughs> When you're in a competition, you don't have time to think about, did I implement everything? So I'm gonna go no on that one. Deception, uh, I think it's too simple. I don't know. Never ending, I like that idea. The time has come, sure, why not? So you, you go through and you can just basically say, I like this one, I don't like this. And you have in a way cast your vote for what will become the final theme. And about, uh, the last day you, you're generally aware of the top 20 themes or so, or top 10 themes that are going to be chosen, but you don't know which one will be picked until the actual start of the event. Now, <clears throat> the rules for Ludum Dare is, the, there's two parts. You have, <coughs> uh, you're <coughs> I'm talking too fast. So you either have the jam or you have the compo. All right, uh, the jam is more, it's for everyone. Teams, individuals, anyone that wants to come out and make something, okay? So you work alone or you're in a team and the goal is to make a game in 72 hours. So that's Friday, over here it starts about four or five in the afternoon, roughly, okay? So um, in fact, we, we can figure, it, figure that out, 22 hours. It's actually two o'clock in the afternoon, I think. So on Friday, yeah, two o'clock, Alaska daylight time. So at two o'clock on Friday, uh, a week from Friday is when it starts and it goes for three days. So basically you'll be finished on Monday at two o'clock. Hey, it's before class. Uh, I'm not telling you to skip class. Okay, so you can use any tools or libraries to create your game. You're free to start with any base code you may have. So uh, now that you're like working on, on this, one hour game jam, it's a good time to kind of get your base code set up. This is what you would start the competition with. Um, <laughs> basically, it doesn't do anything, but it has all your graphic stuff in order. It's, it's made so you can just start, you know, bringing audio in, bringing your 3D models, your sprites in and so on. So you're free to use third party artwork, music, audio assets, or assets you previously created, but we ask that you opt out of the respected voting categories. So if you bring in somebody else's graphics, you should not, you should opt out of the graphics part. Or if you borrow audio from somebody, you should opt out of the audio because the voting is for people who have actually done those things from scratch. So you should use things that you have the legal right to use, public domain, all right? If you don't have the right to use something, it's your responsibility. So you should just use things that are uh, free or better yet, make it from scratch. Uh, for instance, uh, when I create the bunny game, I actually went to my backyard and took pictures of the grass so I could use that as a texture. So I <laughs> created it same day. All right. Um, so they also have some non-video game entries. That's, I don't think that applies to what we're talking about here. Okay, then you have the compo. Now this is what they call classic Ludum Dare. And so one of the things, it's like hard mode. So this is games created entirely from scratch by one person in just 48 hours. And they call this the ultimate test of your game creation skills. This is the only one I do because it's, uh, um, you know, I must like working alone, okay? So you have to work solo. Uh, all of your game, all of your content, art, music, sound, et cetera, must be created in 48 hours. And you have to include your source code. And that's just for the benefit of, yes, I actually did create this in the last two days. <laughs> Nobody ever checks, but people might be interested, okay? So you're free to use any tools or libraries to create the game. You're free to start with any base code you may have. And at the end, you will be required to share your source code. So compo games are typically reviewed harsher than jam games. So if your game closely resembles a sample game that comes with a development tool, you probably aren't going to get a good score. Remember, these are people who, who have been using Unity and Unreal and 
you know, Game Maker and all these other tools, they probably know what's out there. So don't, um, if you're going to use that, make sure you strip all the stuff away from it so that then you can bring your own stuff in. Okay. Nothing says you can't have like a, a platform or base code all ready to go. They're just saying you shouldn't have made the game before then. All right. <laughs> all right. And then source code explained the, that's just basically means that, um, that that's the stuff that makes your game a game. So if you're using a development tool without code, like game maker, then as we see it, your source code is your project file. So they, you know, you want to put everything out there. What I do is I create a GitHub repository and I put everything in the same directory and then, you know, check that's, that's all done. Okay, um, they say if you're unable to share your code and this might be you work for a game company or something and you guys wanna like go in like, oh yeah, this will be fun. Uh, but you have proprietary stuff in there that yeah, you don't wanna do that. And, and a lot of times you'll see companies, the, uh, not the majority, but some will, will say, yeah, we're gonna enter a Ludum the, the jam, okay? They typically look a lot more high quality too because when you have three days and a team of people, uh, you typically can do a little bit better. Uh, but, but not always. I've, I've seen some great compo games that make the jam games look like, wow. <laughs> so um, <coughs> special exemptions. So you can, uh, you have to have the legal right to use something. Okay. So you can use fonts, but if you're going to use fonts, you should have a license to use them in the, the way that you're hoping for, or find some good open source uh, fonts under the SIL license. All right. Uh, you can put a logo or intro screen for you or your brand. All right. Um, photos and recordings you make of people or things are allowed, but you must acquire them during the event, right? So I, like I said, I took a picture of the grass for this last one. Uh, content generators are allowed. In fact, they're encouraged. So SFXR, which is a uh, sound effect generator, uh, that's a tool that was originally created for Ludum Dare. So if you, this is kind of an, a fun tool. Um, you can download it and it's got like all sorts of, uh, uh, you can make a, uh, it makes very 8-bitty kind of sounds. So, but if you're looking for some just sound effects to throw in your game, then, then go for it. <clears throat> okay, uh, texture masks, brushes, drums, loops, sampled instruments, and similar assets are allowed, but only if they're used to create a derivative work. Okay, so for example, um, when, when you're doing like music composition at, and you wanna put a piano in your, you wanna like program a, a piano score, what they're trying to say is that that doesn't mean that you have to go record every key on a piano uh, before you're allowed to use that sound in your game. However, you do have to make sure that the music is brand new. Okay, so this is there's lots of, of reasons why you might be using um, a pre existing stuff like a font, right? You wouldn't go draw a font the same day unless that was the point of the game. All right, so. <laughs> um, and, and generally speaking, derivative works basically is saying, this is what we allow, but we don't want to limit how you create assets and stuff. So for example, uh, bad derivatives. Okay, so if you just take Mario and just turn him into a ninja, that's not necessarily means it's bad, but it's not like you did anything per se, you, you recolored him, okay? Um, or, or take, uh, is this Ash? and turn them into Luigi Ash or something. Okay, so yeah, you're, there's nothing wrong with creating these derivatives, but that might not get you a better score, okay? Um, so they say technically it's a derivative, but there's a big problem. The original artwork belongs to Nintendo who doesn't grant permission to do this sort of thing. All right, these are fan works, harmless, but still legally gray. So if you plan to create artwork this way, you should enter the jam instead. And yeah, just create your own like brand new sprite. That's people will think it's fun. All right. Um, <coughs> uh, here's another uh, colorizing a grain texture is technically a derivative, but it's not a very good one. So if you just take a texture and recolor it, then that's not exactly. Uh, there's ways of like knowing that you faked it. <laughs> okay, but uh, sometimes the tools to generate like I'll use the GIMP to generate textures like this. Um, it's not really hard to do. You just have to have practice. Okay, um, a better derivative uses the grain texture to add detail. For example, we start with a chart, blend it with a distorted version of the grain texture, applying a, apply a scan line post-process effect and play at the level. So they basically took this and used it to color this 
derivative. So this is a great way of doing it because nobody would even know that you just use it as like a way of fast forwarding the process, okay? Um, <laughs> so if you need to make a reference to a well-known character, then make it your own. So in these cases, they really like took it and, you know, you're not gonna confuse this with the drawing Nintendo made. Um, but it also, you can kind of, you know, making Mario kind of look like King Kong or something could also add humor to your uh, to your game, right? So you could take Mario Plumber, normally known for uh, rescuing princesses and turn them into like a tower destroying monster or something. And probably people would think that was funny. Okay. So um, draw to the best of your ability. Your fellow participants are mostly programmers. So don't feel like you need to make good art. <laughs> And this is very true. Just just go in there and just have fun. All right. You'll see. Um, I, I sometimes uh, you sometimes think that Microsoft Paint is like the artist tool of choice uh, for some of these games. So it's all good. <laughs> okay. Uh, music is a highly derivative art form. So songs are often constructed from samples, loops, virtual instruments, and so on. And uh, they give some more um, stuff about music. Okay. So <laughs> at the very end of your 48 hours or 72 hours, they give you an extra hour to package your game up. Okay, so they figure that don't rob you of the time that you might want to actually upload your game, you know, when you could be using that for polish. Um, so <clears throat> if you're late, you have to submit your entry to the jam. So if you're trying to enter the compo, make sure you pay attention <coughs> uh, to, the, to the time. Now, here's some cool things you can do. <clears throat> you can port your game after the 48 hours. So let's just say you're, uh, you made a game and you're using Unity and you're just like, okay, I'm done with the Windows version. Let's get this out the door. Well, if you wanted to, you can always compile it to the web thing for later, uh, but maybe that's something you need to do the next day or, or day after, you can do that, all right? So porting is okay. Um, the longer you wait though, the less time participants will have to play your game. What that means is that if you wait two and a half weeks to get a port out to another system like HTML, yeah, you're probably not gonna get very many people playing that. Uh, and if people don't wanna download your executable, then that could be another thing that people don't like to do either. Now there's certain things like, you know, like for example, I, my bunny's moving around while it's dead. Um, certain bug fixes are allowed. You can't add new features, but if something's broke or didn't work correctly as you were finishing up, you can finish this fix this after the deadline. So you should tell them, highlight the changes you make in your submission, like a little change log. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean play, people have played your game or are going to go back and play it, but <laughs> at least future people will know what you did. It's honesty is the best policy there. Just, just, you know, if you, I would say, yeah, the bunny was moving around while dead. I, fi I fixed that, you know, that way people know the look and they're like, okay, yeah, no big deal. All right. Now, if you like suddenly added three extra levels, then uh, people are be like, yeah, you didn't do this during the jam. So <laughs> probably gonna mark you down overall because you kind of broke the rules. All right. So <laughs> uh, you, you can upload screenshots to the website, but you have to host your binaries somewhere else. GitHub is a great place to do that. All right. Um, I'll let you read the judging and there's no prizes or anything. This is a, uh, um, you are not technically required to use the theme. However, yeah, people are probably gonna be like, you could have done something, <laughs> okay? Okay, so <clears throat> any questions on Ludum Dare? Everybody excited? No? Dreading it? So here's what I don't expect you to do. I, I do not expect you guys to literally spend 48 or 72 hours in a row making a video game. And, and this is one of the reasons I've had you do the Ludum, uh, the one hour game uh, uh, on the weekend is so that you get, you know, better at making a, sm a small game in like a couple hours. And uh, my experience with Ludum Dari is there's always games that never get rated because people tried to be too lofty in their goal and they ultimately didn't get anything happening. Um, so I would pick like a single game mechanic something that's gonna take you a couple hours to implement and just just spend six hours working on it. So maybe a lot of you have been spending about three hours working on a game. Well, spend six hours, you know, spend a little bit more time on it and use that time to polish it up, you know, put a main menu screen, a way to quit your program, a little help, you know, spend a little bit more time on it and <laughs> um, 
and that'll do the trick. Okay, so uh, that's what I would recommend. Uh, what I, because I, I don't even have 48 hours. I have family and to, to tell my wife and kids, sorry, I'm not going to be here for two days straight. Literally, that's never going to happen. Um, so what I do is I limit mine to eight to 12 hours of development time. And uh, I figure that just by getting better at putting stuff together, uh, you know, the, the bunny game didn't take me more than 12 hours to make. And so, which I think that was good. I learned a new graphics technique. I learned, you know, how to make a virtual pet game and a few other things. So I've lots of check boxes for things I've been wanting to do. Now I don't feel compelled to go and do that again, but um, <coughs> that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. <coughs> All right. So uh, next on the agenda, uh, we talked about the homework, talked about Ludum Dare less than two weeks away. Uh, I would definitely take your um, oops, definitely take your one hour game jams and maybe try to polish them up or you know get get a basic mechanic like it's better to kind of finish what you have but just focus on those little things that's why I had you guys uh, or suggested you guys do the little Atari assignment go find out you know what games like what simple things can you do to, that makes a game you know fun all right okay so we're going to talk about the uh, alias wavefront OBJ material format and vertex array buffers today, but not necessarily in that order. Now I'm looking at it. So <laughs> uh, last time uh, we reviewed a number of libraries that we'll try and include in our program. So we're, we're going to use GLFW to do the window context uh, glue so it can actually use OpenGL instead of uh, the original OpenGL. Nothing wrong with original OpenGL works great but we would like to use shaders and that's not a feature in original OpenGL. Okay, then we have the actual base OpenGL library, the GL utility library, which I think is probably not necessary anymore. So, well, we'll probably skip it, but it has useful information in it. Uh, and then we will eventually want to load images. So I like to use SDL2 uh, and SDL2 underscore image so I can actually load PNGs and JPEGs. Uh, uh, so we'll, I'll teach you how to do that. Okay, and then uh, we talked about how to do graphics in Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So GLFW really is the magic thing there because you can, all these libraries are cross-platform. And uh, we also talked about how to create an OpenGL ES 3.0 shader, uh, which is good for, let's see if I can make like that, uh, which is good for WebGL 2, 2.0. All right. <coughs> um, Maybe the later this week, I'll show you my other uh, 3D engine that works with HTML5. So if you're thinking about doing this stuff in the browser, the browser is also really easy to use too. And you pretty much don't need to include anything because everything's built in. The, br the browser knows how to load graphics. It knows how to do just about everything. Okay, um, not gonna talk about this too much. We have lots of, uh, these, are, these are good libraries though, like Allegro, um, that's a good game library. Doesn't take up a lot of space. Uh, okay, so uh, what we did in our program was clearing the screen to something other than black, adding a keyboard callback, having some ability to start initialize a program and, and draw, um, talking about how the black screen aids or doesn't aid in debugging, right? If you have no shader, you get a white rectangle, you would get with a shader, you get a black rectangle. So the black rectangle does not help you. Um, we spent some time talking about the OpenGL pipeline uh, <laughs> I should probably resize those graphics, but more or less the most important parts is the vertex shader, the fragment shader, making sure we have a way to get our vertices in through this pipeline, and then we can control some of this other stuff. Um, so we'll probably talk about that next week or maybe on uh, Wednesday. Okay, so there's a lot of necessary things that we have to do. So. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, we don't get the uh, expected response, right? So we need to have a array buffer to store vertices on the graphics card. Uh, we need to describe what that vertex format is going to look like. We need to have vertex shaders installed. Um, and, well, it's technically a program which has a vertex and a fragment shader. And then uh, we left off last week mentioning that we can use uniforms of specify constants, but we haven't actually done those yet. So we'll probably do those today as well. So um, these are just some of the functions you would use if you're doing shaders. 
most of the time I like to wrap these around some C++ class that does all this work for us. So we're, we're not like interacting with the API because the API is pretty, um, you know, I could look at this slide. So what does this have to do with games? And I would probably say nothing. <laughs> or I could say, what does this have to do with medical imaging? And I'd probably say nothing. Or what does this have to do with uh, showing off a scientific visualization? I would probably look at this screen and say nothing. It has nothing to do with that. Okay, there's, so we, we want to hide this stuff, uh, encapsulate it somehow behind the scenes so that we can, we can focus on the real problem at hand. <coughs> okay, so um, the slides on how we create shaders and programs, and uh, we're going to talk about this in just a second. All right, so we also talked about uh, elements of a GLSL program, okay? So in using in and out for uh, variables, um, and there is some differences from GLSL 1.0. For example, you define your own output variable in the fragment shader with GLSL 2.0 or 3.0, uh, but you don't do that in 1.0. And you use varying an attrib, uh, or actually at, should be at, attribute. Let me fix that real quick. Attribute. Okay. <laughs> Instead of uh, in and out. So here's an example of vertex shader. And what we're able to do is say, we're gonna take three matrices in as uniforms, a world matrix, a camera matrix, and a projection matrix. And we're gonna lay these out so that the position comes first, the normal comes second, the texture coordinate comes third, the color comes in fourth, and we have some generic attribute coming in uh, fifth. All right, if we add the memory requirements for this, we have uh, three, six, eight, and 16 and a float takes four bytes. So that, that equates to 64 bytes per vertex, which is a pretty, it's a nice round computer number, right? We like numbers like 64, we hate numbers like 45. Okay, so um, 64 lines up nicely in your memory. That's roughly um, 64 times eight is about one kilobit of information, I think. Make sure that's right, 64, no, 512 uh, kilo, uh, kilobits. So if you've ever seen like a, your graphics card has a 512-bit bus, what that means is it's gonna shove one vertex at a time, like through the graphics card memory, which is pretty amazing. But if you pick, uh, pick things that are like shorter than that or longer than that, then it might have to split it, or you're just wasting, you know, you could have gotten some extra data uh, through the bus for free. So <laughs> I like to pick round computer numbers because uh, they will, uh, you know, it helps us ensure that we will get the right. Um, oh, that's why that looks all funny. I was, I was like, why are these uh, characters? Sorry, that it's because uh, PowerPoint auto detected. I was using a list format. So I have to fix that. Okay. So um, anyways, uh, we have, we have basically five inputs, and I technically should have added this as an output, but we'll worry about that later. So <laughs> uh, we're gonna send out the, and I, I use uh, I, I could also use V, um, um, using I as input. So I for the position and F for the fragment shader. I may, I may change that to V uh, so that I know that this is a vertex shader uh, variable, and this is a fragment sh uh, shader variable. Um, they have to match, okay? So we, when we take a look at the next uh, screen, right? Uh, these, will, these will match. So these are coming in from the, frag, from the vertex shader, all right? So if I said this was a VEC4 and that this was a VEC3, the compiler is gonna say, nope, this don't work. I'm not gonna link your program. It depends on how nice the vendor is. So NVIDIA tends to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty flexible. They'll say, eh, it's okay, I'll let, that, I'll let that one through this time. But the Intel compiler sometimes is like, nope, you're on your own. Uh, so you, you have to just be aware that AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA all have different, um, <coughs> some of them stick to the spec closer than others. I'll put it that way. So be careful with NVIDIA because they are a little more, um, a little more loose with, the, with what they'll let you do. But it's not a bad thing, but it, it is a bad thing if you suddenly want to like compile your shader on Intel and then your program crashes on you for no reason at all, which is, which is happening to me. Okay, so over here, um, 
let me move this out of the way. Uh, <laughs> we're going to create a, a model view projection matrix. So remember, our matrices work right to left. Okay, so we want to apply the world matrix first, the camera matrix second, and the projection matrix third. All right, so this is how we multiply them together. And we see over here, all the way on the right is going to be our position. Okay, so this is a this is going to have our one matrix to rule them all. We just have to do one matrix multiply and then uh, generate our GL position. So, um, <coughs> okay. So fragment shader. Uh, this one um, I declared a uniform with a with a color. So I sometimes prefix these with U just to let me know that hey, this is a uniform. Depends. You know, the, the, the biggest thing is be consistent. So that you, it helps to know what this is when you're looking at the code, all right? Is this a variable you declared um, inside this function or is it something coming in? It's helpful to see that because then at a glance, I know that this is a color that I can specify from outside. And O color is my output. Okay, so what's next for shader? So last week we, we talked about load and compile use and linked. So we showed how that works in the code, but now we want to uh, add some uniform support. All right, so we'd like to be able to specify, I think this is like a minimum requirement. You need these ones. <laughs> so we'd like to specify a, a three or four component vector and either an integer or a float, although I think floats more important for these ones. Uh, a uniform matrix, uh, three by three or four by four. That one actually should be more of a float, but it's, I guess, um, yeah, let's just get rid of that. Minimum, minimum, okay. <clears throat> and then uh, a uniform scalar value. So just like a single int or a single float. There's a reason you want both, okay. Um, oh, I know why, sorry. I know why I did. Uh, anybody guess why I chose the integer for the vector? Because you might want to put a color in RGB like 0 to 255 or something like that. Okay, so that's fine. Matrices, you, you don't do integer uh, matrices. Okay, so these are the three. Uh, so uniforms, uh, you use I either because you need to specify an integer or you need to tell it where a texture location is, is, is going to be. So you have these things called units and that's where you put your textures. Okay, and then I return bool if it couldn't do that. And we'll see how these work. <laughs> um, and then we're going to start to talk about the refactoring the buffer object issue. Okay, so we'd like to load up objects and uh, we'd like to go ahead and, and try to load the alias wavefront object format. So before I, I keep going, um, I don't want to skip over the, uh, the, the source code for the uniform variables. All right. Um, do not recover. I opened the wrong one up. Let me... Open oh, recent projects. I want this one. <coughs> okay, so in my source code files, um, I, I have refactored the shader program into its own class. So let's take a look at that class here. And can everybody see it? So it looks pretty big. Just a little bit, okay. So um, yeah, so what I did was created a, uh, a class and I, and I have these set uniform vector values over here. So in this case, you know, we'll pass everything by reference. We'll pass the name as a const char. And um, uh, for these ones, you know, we have some private variables, you know, the program, the vertex shaders, and then I have a, a little utility function that loads this from source code. But let's go ahead and take a look at these uniform uh, variables. <coughs> and uh, they, they all pretty much have the same uh, pattern. So first of all, we check to see if the program is linked and if it's not linked to return false, because these functions will not work if the program is not linked. 
Then secondly, we use this uh, um, GL get uniform location by passing it the program number and the name. So inside the, uh, uh, for example, in the fragment share, I can say, where is U color located? And it'll tell me what slot, it's an integer number. Or I could say, what's where's world matrix located at or camera matrix or projection matrix? And it'll return a number if they are used, all right? And so this is an issue is just because you write it in the shader doesn't mean that that variable will be exposed on the outside. Because if I never use, <coughs> let's say this uh, fragment shader, let's just say I, I decided I'm not gonna use U color anymore. I'm just gonna like hard code the color blue in there. Well then if U color is not used, then when the program gets linked, that gets ignored because technically it's trying to make the smallest machine code possible to run on your GPU. So it's not going to just save space for a variable that you thought you may or may not want to, you may or may not even want to use. So it's going to strip everything out. So it's a tiny little set of uh, assembly language and upload that on the graphics card. So when we go over here, we, we ask, hey, what location is this uniform at? And then <coughs> uh, we check to see if that location is less than zero. So if the location is less than zero, then we return false. In other words, hey, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't call this uh, uniform variable. Otherwise we call GL uniform and the spec. So three FV means it's three components, it's a float and V means I'm passing a pointer, okay? So uh, for this class here, my vector three class, I have a, a, a method that returns a const pointer because this, specifically because this is so useful. All right, so I have it send a const pointer out um, and uh, we're sending one of these through, okay? So uniform vector 4F is pretty much the same thing. Check if it's linked, grab the, the uniform location. If it's less than zero, return false. Otherwise, call uniform 4FE, okay? And I'm, I'm using a vector four because I know there's four components in there. Um, <coughs> Uh, GL uniform matrix four is a little bit different. Oh, that's a bug. Let's change that. Um, what this does is you pass in the location, the number of matrices, uh, you return, you use false here because this is asking if you want to transpose the matrix going up into the OpenGL library. Some, um, the way that you declare a matrix will determine whether it's column major order or row major order. And that's a memory layout issue with um, in C. So if you were to write like a double scripted array, that's row major format. But <laughs> in OpenGL, it is technically expecting the, your matrices to be in column major format. In other words, the instead of you know the C++ style, your, your uh, array elements go left to right um, instead, you go, you work column by column, and you're returning basically four column vectors to OpenGL. All right. <coughs> so uh, we'll just keep that in mind. And there's uniform matrix 4F, set uniform 1F. This is the same idea, except we don't need to pass in a pointer. We can just copy by pass by value for these. So we use G GL uniform 1F. And you'll notice OpenGL uses the same more pattern, more or less, to duplicate lots of behavior. There's because this is a C library, you can't just use um, multiple uh, signatures with the same name. All right, and that's that's as simple as it is to actually set these uniforms. So let's take a look at this in in the program. So. <coughs> uh, I also, if you've had a chance to take a look at the source code, I added the ability to uh, handle keyboard input. And so we can move some characters around. All right, I'll let you look at that on your own. But we were, we were concerned with, uh, you know, what our, what our program looks like. So we still have our square here, um, but we're gonna see how load shaders works. So uh, over here on, on update, <laughs> we go ahead and update some uh, positions, check keys uh, for, for input. And on the render command, we have to give three matrices. Uh, remember last time uh, we found out that, you know, our shader wouldn't compile at, well, it did compile, but then we had nothing. It was because I accidentally forgot we hadn't put the shader, the uh, matrices in. 
now that now that we can put the matrices in, we have to go ahead and make them. So the camera matrix is we use the look at matrix for that one, which takes three vectors. Not really vectors, they're actually positions. Okay, but we have the I position. So this is the location of the camera. So in this case, we're 10 units down the positive Z axis. And the second argument is the center. <laughs> in other words, where is the camera pointed to? So I have this set pointing to the origin of the, of the scene. And then we have uh, the up vector. So because we know we're looking down the Z axis, we know that the Y direction is perpendicular. And the vector will uh, look at, will try to make sure that the up vector is perpendicular. The only time you have a problem is if you try to look straight down or straight up. Uh, but I think I have a detection there to make sure that we're not looking, that we don't need to like swap axes or something. Then we have the projection matrix. This is what's gonna give it that 3D look, all right? And we're gonna say, let's give us a 45 degree angle of view. And um, the aspect ratio is we divide width, the screen width by screen height. So this is a variable that I calculate when the window reshapes. And then the Z near and Z far, <laughs> I say Z near is one and Z far is 100. So anything we'll be draw, uh, drawing will, will be visible if it's from one units to 100 units in front of the camera. Anything behind that or after that will be clipped. Okay, so, <clears throat> so over here, I use my program, which calls us the GLU's program. And then I can set my, uh, my camera matrix and projection matrix. Typically, because you're, you're only using one projection matrix and one camera matrix, you can set this up one time. The matrix that's gonna change frequently is the world matrix, all right? And so uh, for the world matrix, um, I, I have some objects here and I call it A2600. I put a namespace, A2600, uh, just kind of in like the Atari 2600. And all it does is uh, we create a translation matrix. Uh, so we can pass in the X and Y position. And <coughs> then we set the uniform. And then I also set the color to whatever the color I decided that the uh, um, object was. I just generate some random colors when the program starts. And then I do GL draw arrays which uh, is going to just draw four vertices, which we had defined a square, okay? So let's, uh, let's run this. It's gotta recompile because I had to rename the um, GL uniform matrix. Somebody asked me uh, after last class, how easy is it to make your own like vector library? Or, you know, and I said, it's, it's pretty easy, but it takes a long time to get those down simply because you have typos like, you know, from copying and pasting, like the uniform matrix is a good example of, yeah, I was trying to make my matrix three class and I used my matrix four class as a basis and I just forgot to update a few small things. Okay, so uh, in this, um, <coughs> in, in this uh, little uh, demo, I can use the arrow keys uh, to control the green box and I can use the, WASD keys to control the um, the blue box, which is not very visible. Blue is, I probably should pick different colors, but anyways, uh, this is uh, one, one effective way to use one shader to kind of, you know, get you more than, um, to be used by more than one object. So, so we basically created a material, right? A diffuse kind of cut material for, for our objects. This is pretty good. Um, sometimes I like to check how big is my program because uh, <laughs> I'm not going to complain that some of the projects that have been submitted are over 100 megabytes, but they kind of are, <laughs> which I think it's funny. Um, uh, I kind of grew up on a computer that the first computer I ever had had five kilobytes of RAM that I could use. So I've always like, I guess it was drilled in my brain. Can you fit this smaller and smaller? Um, so, but anyways, let, let's see how big this one turned out to be, uh, 64 release, it's my application in there. It is 224 kilobytes just to put two squares on the screen. Hello, 2019. <laughs> so, uh, it's going to take some effort 
Has anybody heard of the 4K challenge or 64 kilobyte challenges? These are these are challenges. Um, let's see if we can find uh, like a 4K demo. So these are these are demos, and they're made entirely in four kilobytes of memory. So yeah, we can see that. Watch a watch a few minutes of this. And it has sound. Yeah, I probably did some kind of random terrain generation for this. So that's that's one and um, <laughs> not 4K video. Let's see what somebody did here. This is another 4K intro. I don't know why this takes. So this looks like it's probably a collection of 4K demos. People are excited about this stuff. You can tell it's a very Euro thing to do. That's actually my second time. So I'll just skip forward through this. And sometimes they'll just get through and they'll like have like a little party and they'll just like code these things up in a weekend or so. There's one. Let's look at this next one. I believe the chat has, has recognized that we have jumped to a new area of this. Uh, not me, by but go fake yourself. Uh, go fake yourself with no entry. Not coded while not driving at 200 kilometers per hour. No code, no tune, no art, no graphics. pretty simple and then like there's a few that are like just incredible um but this looks like the one they used on the video Thank you. 
anyways, so you can do a lot with 4K and obviously my program is doing very little with 224, but it's just amazing how many uh, ways that we've come out to create like, like I wonder what 100 megabytes is doing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like it, and it's like it's not like you even get an option you may have literally written less than like two kilobytes of code but when it compiles you have 100 megabytes you got to distribute to somebody um <laughs> so this is just one of those things nowadays it's like you can't get away from it even even unity probably the uh really popular one you know you're talking close to 30 megabytes you know just to get out the door so crazy um Anyway, so I've always had a thing for like small memory sizes, but even my program, I feel like there's no way that I should be using that much memory. Um, I probably need to strip it. There's probably a lot of extra stuff in there that I need to strip. So part of it's maybe not using the tool appropriately. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at, uh, oh yeah, we did take a look at it. Um, <coughs> um, but let's see what else we could do with it. So one of the things um, that's very popular is to uh, modify things with time okay and we can I can do this by let me go to my main loop here so right now I'm calculating um, like the total time but maybe I can put this in a global variable I'll put it in this a2600 I'll, I'll call it uh, double or float current time I will just initialize that to zero and then when we call on update, we'll just uh, set that uh, current time equals to the current. So we need to cast it to a float because it's a double. <laughs> okay, because uh, what I wanted to show you was uh, the rotate matrix. All right. So uh, one thing we wanted to do is, uh, you know, we got to see if we need to rotate first or rotate before or after. So what do you think we're gonna have to do? Rotate first or rotate after if we just want the rectangles to rotate in place? And mean, meanwhile, I'm, I'm gonna... Call to call. Why do you think it's going to be afterwards? <laughs> I think we do it first. Okay. How many people are in favor of doing it first? Okay. We got three. Who, who's in favor of doing it afterwards? One. Okay. So we'll do it first. Okay. And two are abstaining. I don't know why, but they are. Um, okay, so we're going to rotate along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. All right, and um, let's go ahead and see what happens if we rotate first. I think that I think we need to make it faster. Let's let's increase that speed by um, angles per second, 15. Let's try 15 degrees per second sounds right. Yeah, you're right. That way we don't have to wait like 360 seconds for us to go around. Okay, so let's just move these out. So, <laughs> it feels weird to me like I feel like if I'm moving it it's moving around in space it's not rotating around its local origin okay so here's here's why this does not work we have to go our, our transformations go right to left so if it's going right to left then translation is the rightmost matrix and rotate is the leftmost matrix so we're applying rotation after. So first we're saying, let's move out, then let's rotate. So we wanna rotate first. And this is one of the things you just have to get it, develop an intuition for this um, is the thing you do last, what feels like what you're doing last is what happens first. 
So now if I move uh, these objects over, <coughs> uh, they're still moving around on the screen. So if I move left or move right, move up or move down, I still, I feel like it's actually moving with my mouse cursor and it's not like I'm suddenly moving this way. They're still moving a little, a little slow and <coughs> um, those colors are still a little off. I, I can't, the blue one's really hard to see. So we need to go ahead and um, initialize those. Uh, let's see here, do I set it? Aha, okay. It's in this game object class that I made. Okay, I'm just going to set this. Um, normally we need to call it srand, but let's just saturate the blue for. So if it's going to be blue, it's going to be bright blue, or it's going to everything is going to be tinted blue. And then let's set the rotate speed to be a little bit faster so we can see what happens. Um, and let's go a little closer. So we'll move the camera in by changing the position of the camera. And then let's just uh, put a float for the rotate speed. So let's go 30. Now in C++, you can use this const expression uh, <coughs> instead of const. And what it'll do is the compiler will try and put that as a constant actually in the code, which is different than before where it would declare a variable and then in your code, it would have to look up the variable value. Okay, so let's see, we got the two going. I think the blue is a little bit brighter. Okay, <clears throat> now you notice that when we're rotating, they, they have this very peculiar motion. It looks like, like a fan kind of like rotating in this very strange direction. And that's because when you when you use Euler angles to rotate, <clears throat> you get this gimbal lock uh, that happens. And uh, as soon as you start getting to the other half, then it looks like the object is suddenly rotating the opposite direction. All right. So uh, this was this was one of the reasons why we want to use quaternions eventually to represent rotations, because a quaternion, when we interpret uh, two rot um, two quaternions together, we're gonna to be able to get a smooth motion from one orientation to the next. Whereas if we did this with uh, Euler angles, we could get some like weird spinning motion as we go from one um, representation to the next because we're doing three separate rotations in, in an uh, X, say X, Y, Z order, but that becomes an issue. <laughs> All right, any questions so far? Okay, so, so the next part is, you know, you're probably saying this is nice. But we only have squares on the screen. It'd be nice if we did something different. So that's what we're going to start working on this week is how can we look at, how can we put geometry into our scene? So let me go back to the slides. And <coughs> we had talked about refactoring the shader program code. It's a lot more usable now because now we're not thinking when we're using it, I don't feel like we're trying to manipulate memory, uh, you know, or compile shaders, I'm thinking, yeah, I can pass, I can load my shader up from the disk and I can pass it the information that I specified in it. Okay, so we radically changed that code around. It now feels like it has a purpose. So um, for the geometry class, uh, we want to refactor the buffer object because right now it just looks like a, a fancy way of manipulating a, a giant array of, of data. And uh, we want to represent surfaces that we can, use with draw arrays, all right? So uh, in order to load data, we, we're gonna need a, a way of loading it from the, uh, loading it from the screen I mean, and from a file, uh, some way of creating a buffer and some way of rendering it, okay? And uh, we're gonna use the alias wavefront file format for this because it's one of the easiest ones you can learn how to do. Uh, and two, it's, it's pretty much interchangeable with just about everything. Uh, we're going to make our own modification though to support some extra stuff, but um, uh, for now we'll just take a look at the, the basic, what you need to know about this format. <coughs> okay, so first of all, 
every line is basically a command. And if it starts with a pound symbol, then it's a comment. Just like if you're using Python or something, you might want to put comments in your code. So we support that. If the first character or the non, the first non um, white space character is the pound symbol, we'll just say ignore it. Uh, otherwise, as soon as we start seeing vertices, uh, so if we see the character V, then we are expecting X, Y, and Z coordinates after that. And if we see VN, we're expecting a vertex normal with X, Y, Z coordinates after that. And if we see VT, then we're expecting to see texture coordinates after that. All right, now you might get <coughs> all three of these, but you also might just get two. So we have to keep that in mind as we're processing our code. Now, what we do with these is we maintain a separate uh, vector for every for each one of these, and we just push the latest one at the very end, okay? So as we're reading these vertices in the file, we just push them to the end. And then when we get to the very end part, okay, the vertice for the faces, then we can start reading the indices for these, all right? So V1 is gonna be the index for the vertex, N1 is gonna be the index for the normal, and T1 is gonna be the vertex for the texture coordinate. And you see we have three sets of these. This is one for each uh, uh, polygon. Now, the faces can technically have four on there, and I think it's a good idea to be able to support four, because uh, then you can just, you, you, we can easily come up with an order uh, <coughs> of triangles with that, right? So if this was like a vertex family, I'd say draw this vertex, this one, and this one, and then draw this one, uh, V1, V3, and V4. So we can basically construct a fan so we can actually uh, render this uh, a quad out to the to the screen. Um, now uh, we have some other commands. Oh, I forgot the S command, but it basically means the same as uh, a G. Uh, o means you have a brand new object. So if you interpret that, I mean, you could ig ignore half this stuff if you, if you just want to get the geometry in your file, um, <coughs> uh, or you could uh, use it to separate like surfaces. So uh, a lot of times you'll see. Um, like a material library file, this will say, hey, include this uh, material information. We'll talk about that in the next slide. And then before your object starts, you'll say use material and then whatever your material name is. So if you want a service to have like green grass, then you might have that shade, that material specify the color and the reflection and the uh, texture map for grass. And then if the next one is uh, a concrete block, you know, for the floor, then you might have a concrete block file. Okay, well, we'll take a look at examples of these. Okay, <coughs> now in the material file, these are these can be complex uh, because Alias Wavefront, uh, just for some historical, uh, was the software that used to run on Silicon Graphics workstations in the 90s for doing movies like Toy Story or Jurassic Park. Okay, so as you can tell, or as you may guess, um, the material format has to be able to support lots of those concepts, okay? So um, for all intents and purposes, uh, only a few typically get used. This is a handful of some of those that get used. So uh, new material basically says, hey, we're creating a new material in this file. Um, <coughs> Ka is a constant it's a, for uh, the ambient color. So what color should this object be if there's no reflection? Sometimes you just ignore that. Uh, the diffuse color, so this is, uh, you know, like the chairs here, yellow or blue, the surface of the table, um, that's what color typically the, the albedo is. And we'll talk about those more when we get into uh, a reflection and so on. And then we have the specular exponent. So we might use the um, specular exponent to, uh, tell how shiny an object is, okay? Um, and then we can specify texture maps. So we can see over here that map underscore KD means that this color should be complemented with this texture map. So if you're loading a texture map, then um, you'll use this to uh, uh, override the your given color up here. Or <laughs> sometimes what happens, you just multiply the colors together. So you might have a gray, like a, a black and white or grayscale texture map, and then you might say the diffuse color is green. So now you have a green gray, you know, you multiply those two colors together. Okay, um, let's see here. 
<laughs> okay, so here's the uh, the general pattern for loading files like this. So I might uh, use an IF stream and then I'll just get line as I'm reading the file. And I'll uh, use an I string stream to yeah, in order so I can read each line, all the components on the line. Uh, this is basically just says, hey, take a, a C++ string and teach it, uh, uh, make it like it's acting like a CN or something. Okay. <laughs> so what I do is I, uh, I get the first, the first token, okay? And I check to see if the first character, because this will skip all your white space. Um, and, and all these commands have a token, a string token. So you know that you're pretty safe doing it that way. So if it's a if it starts with a pound symbol, then I just say let's get out of here, uh, let's keep keep the loop going, okay, until we have no more input. Uh, otherwise, if it's a VN, then we'll handle the vertex normal. If the token is O, then we'll create a new surface uh, uh, geometry surface. Um, <laughs> and every new geometry surface essentially is going to be a new call to GL uh, draw arrays. All right, so. <laughs> um, Let's show you, let, let me show you what an OBJ file looks like. So I'm gonna go, it's probably my favorite 3D graphics format just cause they're so useful. Uh, but I'm gonna go to something, say Libix or assets, uh, samples, models. Okay, so let's take a look at this. <clears throat> I'm going to open this up with a text editor. So this was uh, something I created in 3D Studio Max um, <laughs> and just exported it out. So let's just zoom in here. So over here, it's going to use this box dot material. And these are the vertices for my box. So over here, um, it's going basically from minus one half on one corner to positive one half on the other. And they have eight vertices for that because a box is eight vertices. And then we have six sides to a box. So I have six vertex normals. And so you see that this side uh, for VN, this, uh, this side's facing positive Y axis, this side's facing the negative Y axis. This is pointing the negative Z axis. This is pointing at the positive X axis, positive Z axis and uh, positive x axis. Then I have uh, eight texture coordinates. <coughs> and uh, this is because I'm going to use it to draw a 3D texture. But so we're not going to worry about why we have sometimes you might actually have six times. Um, actually, you, you might only need like four coordinates um, for a box because you're you just want to map every side to uh, a face or uh, to a, a basically a, a square texture map. So over here, uh, it creates a new box. So this calls it box and it says use this material called box. And then it specifies 12 faces because uh, I told it, make sure you export triangles. And so you'll see that we're going from vertex one, two, and three, and then four, three, and two, and then five, six, seven, eight, seven, six, four, two, five, six, five, two. I'm just using the normals to, to know, um, you know, roughly the order that they're going in. So it has the effect of basically compressing um, your data, but they're, it's very useful uh, for representing objects. So let me open up the uh, box.mtl. <coughs> and so you can see over here, there's the new material for the box. Uh, these are, you could probably consider these to be the standard, like this, these will go everywhere. Um, so this is how shiny it is. This is the dissolve, so how transparent it is. So it's not transparent. Um, these have to do with the Fresnel reflection. Uh, this is the kind of illumination model that should be used. I ignore that. Uh, there's the, um, the color. So this is the ambient color. This is the uh, diffuse, so it's a white box. And this is the reflection color, like a light gray. And then I say you can use a test a texture map. Okay, so those those two files go together. Um, if you have like the some of the three D features enabled in uh, in Windows, then you can actually turn on the preview for uh, OBJ files. Um, view preview pane, 
So if I were to click on the box, for instance, <coughs> I was gonna, it's gonna be like that. Let's just do this. Uh, okay, I'll just open it up. So paint 3D, for, in, for instance, will we'll load up these objects. Uh, sure, import it too. I think I had to now forget that. Okay, so there's the box. Well, actually, I, you can paint on it. So I have to, this is how I rotate. So you can see it's a box, all right? Um, yeah, you can do some fun stuff in Windows nowadays. This is a tool that kind of comes built in. I'm gonna hit don't save, but I have some other ones like the bunny. This is a very, the Stanford bunny is, is pretty popular. Um, I'm gonna skip the texture map. <clears throat> Stanford Bunny, there's there's like a, a whole repository <laughs> of, uh, of common 3D objects. Uh, they've scanned a bunch of objects like the, the, the bunny, for instance. Um, and then they just share it for other people to use uh, these tools, like the dragon is a popular one. That's still loading. Hopefully it won't take very long. And then they have the armadillo. They have Lucy, which is this uh, angel statue. Um, this is a color 3D model. I haven't seen that one as, as often or the manuscript. They have a Thai statue. I don't think I've seen this one very often either, but it's very complex. Um, they use laser scanning for that. <coughs> so those are some common 3D objects that get used. Let me see what else I have. The Cornell box. Uh, a geosphere, the teapot. You probably have seen the teapot by now. I actually have the real teapot in my office. So maybe I'll bring that in one day. Um, this might be easier to load. I guess I picked the biggest one. <coughs> Let me just close that and try to load up a different one like the teapot. <coughs> Skip the texture. I wonder, I think maybe there's a different tool. Let's, um, 3D viewer. Let me try that tool. This might be, might be better. Okay, there we go. So there's the teapot model. Yeah, this is a lot, a lot quicker, although you can, you know, by using different shaders, you know, you can get different appearances. Okay. So teapot, uh, this one actually scaled so that it's actually the same dimensions as the real teapot. That's, that's a story for another time. Uh, the Mitsuba object is also pretty interesting. Oh, now it's going to work. Oops. <coughs> Maybe. Uh, let's open this up in the 3D viewer. It's the funny thing is I feel like these don't take that long to load up when I do it myself. So sometimes it's just bloat, but um, there we go. This is the Mitsuba object. So this is useful because it's, you know, it's got an inside surface and an outside surface. So this is useful for testing certain global illumination algorithms. Okay, so OBJ files are, are uh, pretty useful. Um, and uh, let's see here. So like I said, the, the general pattern here is we're gonna go through line by line and basically interpret these commands, okay? Um, <laughs> now, to store it in our array buffer, this is more or less the, the 3D structure we're gonna we'll put it in. So this is our vertex. So we have X, Y, Z for our position and our normal. And the this is the, the last slide I have, but we basically will have a array of vertices once we've constructed the whole model together and we'll generate the, the buffer, upload all this data, move this out of the way, um, and then we'll set our vertex attribute pointer. And so you'll notice that this matches our, our uh, file, our vertex shader file, where we had the layout equal zero, layout equal one. And we can say this has got XYZ, XYZ, uh, XY, 
X, Y, Z, W, or <coughs> the way that we're interpreting it is like RGBA. And then this says the offset. So at the very beginning of the structure, we have the X, Y, Z, and then three floats later, we have the normal X, Y, Z. Three floats later, we have <coughs> the texture ST. Uh, two floats later, we have RGBA. And four floats later, we have the generic attribute. So we can use that for whatever else we want to use per uh, color. And then we just enable the vertex attribute array. So on Wednesday, we'll take a look at this in action and um, how we can set that up so we can actually load 3D models from our uh, from disk. All right, so that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I think we're um, we're finished for the day.